I guess I was sort of in a state of fear where I didn't want to turn around and look. A very friendly, welcoming feeling at one instance. I was starting to feel very anxious and very cold. The outlines of a human body, almost complete and total panic. Very visual experiences. Uh, one of the first ones Here I at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, a team is investigating certain common perceptions of the inner mind. So we'll be taking a baseline recording first. Mm -hmm. before we right now, they're looking at the electromagnetic brain patterns seen in people having the near-death experience. Going to compare that. The research is led by Dr. Michael Persinger. Basically, at any given time, all experience is due to those portions of the brain that are most metabolically active. If we can simulate that by applying complex, meaningful magnetic fields to the brain, we can also induce those experiences. This experiment is testing the idea that mystical perceptions and paranormal experiences can be turned on at will, not by hypnosis or shamanic drumming, but by a scientist stimulating nerve activity in the brain. The volunteer sits blindfolded in a soundproof chamber. This sensory deprivation allows the mind to focus on electromagnetic patterns transmitted across the brain through this modified crash helmet. If you feel anything change with the electrodes, they're able to simulate the exact brain patterns that occur in near-death experiences. Is that comfortable? Dr. Persinger hopes the research will benefit psychotherapy. We tried to evoke the fragments that compose the near-death experience and other mystical experiences, such as detachment, feelings of moving through a tunnel, hearing voices, the sense of a presence, usually on the left side. Our major thrust is ultimately to apply this to dealing with things such as psychological depression. After a while, I remember feeling that there was someone else in the room with me, almost looking over my left shoulder. It was all I could do to not turn my head and want to look. If you stimulate the deep portions of the temporal lobe, so you can get very, very vivid imagery, and the emotional commitment or the emotional sensation that something is profound, real, cosmically real, and personally significant. It's a male voice, but it's like really, really far away. As if you can just sort of like catch a tone you can't really hear. You can tell that it's someone talking. You can distinguish that, but you can't make out any kind of words or anything like that. What we've been doing recently is generating words as magnetic patterns. And even though the person isn't hearing it through their ears, their brain is interpreting it. So they're actually having fragments of experiences as if they're hearing it when in actual fact they cannot be. These experiences are so strong, they're utterly real for the person who has them. They can be as profound as a religious conversion, yet we can generate them with a machine. These mind games are beginning to shed their secrets. The scientist becomes the shaman. But where are the limits? What else can people be made to believe? But well, one thing that's really clear, you can control the person's experiences and they don't know they're being controlled. That's why this technology is a potentially powerful one and has a two edge to its sword. As a tool of science, this technology may bring us valuable new understandings of the obscure depths of the human mind. But there's a dark side. In the wrong hands, could it become an instrument of power, a means of oppression? If we're not careful, will mind games one day become mind control?
Next on TLC, how many ways could there be to send the dearly departed to the great beyond? Science Frontiers is deadly serious. Then, it's a peek into the secret life of the telephone.